humans, we're very, I think we're quite limited because we're so scared of being anthropomorphic that we are, we, we try to look at everything in black and white. And of course, it's good to be able to test things scientifically. I think that's vital to the scientific method. But I think that sometimes because of our rigidity in looking at things, we miss things that are vital to the existence or to the way, to the behavior of, of these animals. And I think there's a lot more uh, to the socializing in these animals than one thinks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the See As Many Voices. It's, uh, it's a really special episode. Well, they're all special for me, but this one especially because I've got uh, a very, very good friend of mine and on the show. It's not nepotism, though. He is the world's top blue whale expert. I'm, uh, I still find it hard to... Uh, it's always funny when I talk to people about that I know him, they go, oh, you know Richard Sears? Anyway, I've got Dr. Richard Sears the uh, blue whale expert. And I've also got uh, my good friend and colleague from Deep Green, who's a part sponsor of the program, who's co-hosting with me today, Dan Porras. Uh, Dan uh, is here as well. So let's uh, jump right in here. Um, Dan's going to help me um, unpack you, Richard, a little bit over the next hour or so. Um, I wanted to have a, I like having a co-host, especially when it's a subject matter like ours that I know pretty well. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I, don't, I sometimes I don't know which questions to ask you because I know a lot of what the answers are. But mm -hmm. Richard uh, was taught me, you, you taught me how to identify whales, actually. I don't know if you remember that, but. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I ran a little station, a whale research station when I was in undergraduate college. And Richard was one of our, our uh, volunteer uh, researchers who sat on this rock 50 miles, what was it, 20 miles offshore and studied whales. And I had never seen a whale before. Um, and you taught me how to identify them. And then you went off in your career as uh, a blue whale biologist. And you have just done astounding work, Richard. I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, you started off uh, back east and you've always kept a foothold in uh, Mingan Island, and then you've gone off to Portugal, and you've gone off to Antarctica, and you've gone off to the West Coast. I mean, you've really covered it, but let's just jump right in. There's a question everybody asks me, and I even had the answer wrong, is why, why are they called blue whales? Are they, are they really blue? No, actually, they're, <clears throat> they're kind of a, a word that I've come to use, scenarios, which is different tones of gray. And it just so happens that the configuration of their pigmentation when below the surface gives off a blue reflection to the ambient light. And even on a, even on a cloudy day, a uh, blue whale seen from the air looks blue. Um, so that's why I got the name blue whale, sort of like a blue cow, I guess. They're gray, really. Yeah. And uh, because there's only, uh, there are only a couple of animals in the in mammals anyway, that are, uh, that have blue pigmentation. And that's one of them is the mandrill, kind of a big baboon. And the other one is a monkey of which I should remember the name, but I forget, but the inside of the mouth is blue. And I can't even remember where it lives, but uh, that's the, as far as I know, those are the only uh, blue pigments in, um, in mammals. And of course, blue eyes are a lack of pigment. So. Uh, are their eyes blue? So uh, no, not as, not from the few that I've seen dead. So, but I don't know if in the when they're alive, they may be. Who knows? But I doubt it. I think it's more like brown brown the eyes. Blue whale that I saw on my own and not with you. You know, you've taken me out to see them. But that one that I photographed back in nineteen, you know, seventy eight or nine or eight eighty, off the Gulf of Maine. I'll never forget. Nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. Boy, it surprised the hell out of me. I was, we were doing those aerial surveys on Brown's Bank, and boom, you know, I saw it. And I, I, it was no question in my mind it was a blue whale, because it was blue. It was as blue as, you know, this thing looks blue. It was like so. Yeah, it, it depends on the light, of course, because some of them can appear turquoise, otherwise others steel blue. But, yeah, they're definitely, they, they catch your eye. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a trick, or not a trick, but it's a interpretation of the light, uh, from a particular shade of gray through the uh, water interface that uh, filters. Well, here, maybe if you allow me, I can put in a picture that sort of helps that. 
this is not taken by me, it's taken by one of the guys that's in the Azores. So you can see that what's above the surface here is, is pretty much gray. Yeah. And then notice that what's under the water comes out blue, even the, fate, even the tail, which is down a little bit deeper in the water. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good uh, example of how, uh, you know, what these animals look like. Anyway. It's a real full on bluey, bluey shot though, like, uh, like, like that aerial, I'm thinking like that aerial one that I took a long time ago that was so blue. Yeah, so this, this was actually taken by, uh, uh, I think uh, Amos Nachum, I can't remember, uh, but it was, um, that, that really shows up blue when you're underwater with a good size, well, of course that's using a wide angle, so it looks a little bit smaller than it really is. <clears throat> And you, you can notice that the tips of the flipper are white on this, but, uh, and you can see that there's modeling on the back and on the ventral surface, but there it's definitely blue. You know. you, for, our, for our viewers, and by, by the way, most people will probably be listening to this, but that's okay. But a lot of people do watch it on YouTube. Can you just walk us through what we're seeing? Because a lot of people have never seen this before. Okay, so... This part of the, I don't know, can you see, you can't see my cursor, can you? But on the left side of the, of the image for me, I see the, the head, you see the jawline, um, and you can see how thick the lower jaw is. And even what's interesting about blue whales, and often people don't get it right in their drawings, is that the upper jaw is quite thick as well. And it, has, it, it offers kind of an overbite to the look when you see an animal uh, swimming from above or from the side. And they just have massive jaws. And then you, at the end of the jawline, you can see the eye. And the level of the eyes is actually the widest part of the whale, if you don't count the pectoral fin. And just above the eye on top of the head is where the blowholes are, or the nostrils, if you want, is through which they breathe. That's good. Just walk us down like you are. That's a beautiful, give us a tour of the largest animal that's ever lived <clears throat> on the on well, beside behind the head on all of these whales it's really just a very long tube of muscle i mean there you can see the muscle line back towards the stern there of the animal you can see the dorsal fin just a little tiny lighter colored excrescence on the back way back just before yeah, it gets to the tail that. okay and yeah. And uh, so you, it's just a mass of muscle because these animals, of course, go through this very dense medium, which is the, the ocean. And uh, even more so when they're taking a mouthful, just imagine when they open up their mouths to feed, they're basically pushing against the ocean, which is just phenomenal when you think about it. The power that these animals can bring to bear when they're taking a mouthful, whether it be on their side or vertically or what have you. So this is the long tube of muscle. And I mean, if you think of humpbacks, humpback whales that are known to breach quite a bit, if you try to do what a whale does, jumping out of the water, there's no way you can do it. You have to push off the bottom of a pool to get even close to that. So it just shows you how powerful these animals are. And of course, the blue whales get up to what, uh, in feet, most of them, but by the time you get to about an 80 foot animal, that's pretty good size, but we know that they get up to over a hundred feet. And, um, and then you see the tail way back there, which is um, uh, what helps to propel them forward. But it's really the musculature, the undulation of the body that propels these animals through the water. And the head is what, like a third or 25? Yeah, it varies, yeah, I would say a little less than a third. It could be a third of the body length on a really big, large animal. But uh, of course they have to have <clears throat> this large mouth and what you see underneath the, the pleats there are the lines that you can see that go from in front of the pectoral fin to behind it. That is called the ventral pouch. And <clears throat> it's actually part of the mouth, believe it or not. And uh, when the animal opens up its jaws to feed on krill, it uh, fills up that ventral pouch. So it's as though you and I had a big pouch down here on our necks and we would balloon out with water and, and pray. And then once that's been filled up, they close their mouth, uh, not completely, and the muscular action of the ventral pouch and of the tongue, which is a very muscular organ in, in whales, forces the water out through the baleen plates, which hang from the upper jaw. And um, once the water's been evacuated, they swallow the krill. 
And that can amount, they can take a mouthful about every minute. And blue whales are the largest animal that have ever lived on the planet. Is that correct? As far as we know so far, there's some dinosaurs that have start to approach it in length, but not in mass. So, and a, a Richard, hundred, yeah. Sorry, speaking of, speaking of dinosaurs, I <laughs> wonder if we can go back. Um, so, as, as Greg mentioned, you know, I think he brought me on as uh, I'm, a, I'm a whale novice, uh, I admit. And so, but it just so happens I had started a book um, just a couple days ago called Becoming Wild about um, different cultures of different animal species. And, and the book opens with uh, sperm whales. And one of the things I was surprised to find out as a whale novice is that, so, so Greg has told me that, you know, many scientists believe life came from the ocean. And, but in fact, with whales, it's the reverse that they started on land and went to the oceans or went back to the ocean. Um, what about that? And what in the age of the dinosaurs or, or before, uh, what was a whale on land and how did it wind up back in the ocean? Now, that's an interesting question that I've often I had I was lucky enough to got, talk to a guy from uh, University of Michigan. I think I always get Michigan State and University of Michigan mixed up. But anyway, uh, Dr. Gingrich, and he is um, one of the main people who has discovered missing links in the evolution of marine mammals. And he had one animal he named, which I thought was a great name, called Ambulocetus natans. So. He who walks, but also swims. And let's just take the gray whales that you know well from off your coast there. And you know that they go down to the Baja uh, Peninsula and they go into lagoons there to uh, calve and breed perhaps. So just imagine, you know, tens of millions of years ago or more, they were precursors to what we know now as gray whales. And they may have little by little started going into these lagoons because A, they found some food, they were supported by the water because they were no longer as efficient on land to run away from potential predators that might have been there. And little by little over the eons, these animals found that it was easier to operate in the, in the oceans because of their size. And they may have even developed larger size. Matter of fact, it's almost certain. And then little by little, they started migrating outside the lagoons. And then as they were looking for food, the migration extended. I mean, it could have been something like that. I'm speculating, but I, that's what I've, I've always imagined. And so <clears throat> these animals that uh, had been on land found that it was better for them in the oceans. And they found masses of small critters, relatively small critters that they could feed upon. And once they exhaust, once they, uh, you know, depending on the season, they found that the, it was probably to their advantage to start migrating on some of these very long migrations along the coast up towards Alaska and beyond. But that's, you can imagine something like that. And there, there are many other um, missing links now that Gingrich, Gingrich and others have discovered. But yeah, I think it's fascinating. Uh, to, I, think, I think, matter of fact, it would be really interesting to do um, uh, sort of a little sort of animated film on the evolution of this. You could sort of, you, you now have enough information on missing links that you'd be able to um, to do something that would be kind of interesting to look at. I remember years ago, there was an animated film on evolution, which I thought, which always caught my attention, but you could do something specific on, on these animals. Yeah. You know, Fascinating. You, you brought up a, uh, a really good topic area that I had wanted to cover. It's in my notes here, and that's the, the evolutionary context of whales and especially blue whales. And what, what you can see here is the pectoral flippers are the, uh, uh, the remnants of, not remnants, they're the, they're the modification of our forelimbs, which we have as arms. And they had once had legs, uh, so to speak. They weren't legs, but they were appendages, hind quarters. And well, they were they were legs in some, in some cases, just very stumpy ones. Yes, they were. They were, and uh, you can find uh, to talk about the the, the the evolutionary remnants of those legs that are still there. 
Well, yeah, actually, first I was going to point out what you're bringing up is the pectoral fin. And I think it's really fascinating because if you were able to open that up and look at the skeletal structure, you would find the same bones in slightly different configurations that we have in our arm. Some of them are more compressed than the whales, but what's really fantastic is that the finger leg, or uh, you know, the fingers, the phalanges, as you call them, are all in the flipper. And you can see them a little bit in this picture. You can see the lines that at the, at the end there that show that, the, that there are these elongated fingers inside the flipper. Yeah. Now, as far as the hind limbs, it's very much, it's just vestigial bones that remain. There's the, the remains of the pelvic girdle and uh, largely, and also from which the bones from which legs might have uh, were at one point existent in these animals. And actually, I think there's a picture of a humpback an at, with an atavistic um, projection of a hind limb coming out from its side. I can't remember where I saw this, but there was a, so there are occasionally sort of throwbacks that uh, were part of the, uh, where the, for some reason, the genetics um, reveals some of the past th in the present form of an animal. Yes, happens to us too. People um, will have uh, characteristics, will express themselves uh, that were from our, our, ancient, our ancient past. Um, it's an it's a interesting part of that. And, and then when they went back into the ocean, and, the, and let's say we're talking about blue whales today, but they are part of a uh, um, uh, uh, class mammalia. It's a, the order Cetacea, isn't it? And then there's suborder Mysticetus and Odontocetus. Order. Okay. So in this order of, of, of organized uh, oceanic mammals, marine mammals, are a whole bunch. There's about 70, 80 different types. And they range from um, uh, the blue whale, which is the largest, and then there's sister or cousins for, that are very similar, but just different shapes and sizes. And they include the fin whale, the say whale, the minke whale, the humpback whale, the gray whale. Those are all kind of have the same general characteristics. And then on the other track, you've got the dolphins, the ones, the ones with teeth. You've got the dolphins, the killer whales, the sperm whales. So you can easily distinguish these two, these two suborders of marine mammals as um, toothed and non-toothed. And the non-toothed, the mysticete whales, which this is, they got really big. They got so big. Why did they get so big? What was the what was the deal there? I mean, <laughs> well, from what I understand, it was um, the volume uh, because well, you have to think that these animals will <clears throat> migrate to colder waters, yeah. and even if they were in warm water, they tend to dive down pretty deep on occasion to look for food. So the as you get away from the surface, the water gets quite cool, and so the mass that they have for for their body. Uh, uh, preserves them from the cold as well as, of course, their blubber layer and so on. So that, that mass helps them with energy requirements. But also, um, they needed to have the body and the musculature because of the jaws and the way they went about feeding. Uh, they, you know, they, have, they have to have very powerful muscles to open and close those jaws so many times over a very long lifetime. Um, because there's a tremendous amount of strain, of course, when they're pushing against the ocean and trying to snap after different kinds of prey, depending on the species. And, uh, and also the fact that they live in the oceans, they're not fighting gravity. The only thing they have to deal with, um, if they do, is pressure gradients. Um, and so there really isn't that much of a limit on them due to gravity the way there is for land animals. I mean, elephants and rhinoceroses are pretty much uh, you know, have, have evolved to be pretty much the limits of size to get, be able to get around. There were, of course, larger animals on land at one point, the giant sloth and so on. But um, one can presume that they petered out. Perhaps their large size caused them some problems and, you know, slow moving so predators could get at them and things like that. That, that idea is important, I think, for our audience to think about for a minute here, that these these animals don't have to deal with gravity. Gravity is a big deal for us humans. You know, it, it's, uh, it pulls us to the ground. It, 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 it limits how big we can get. It, uh, it, 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 
It requires that we have bones to uh, structure our bodies in certain ways. And when you're in the ocean, it's like being in outer space. There's no gravitational effect that you can feel. There is gravity, of course, but you just can't feel it because you're you've become buoyant. You've become part of the medium in which you live, uh, rather than um, uh, in the air and on the and then standing on the land. And this 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 has enabled this massive explosion in size, which also um, Interestingly, whales don't have a problem ever getting too cold, but they do have a problem of getting too hot. And yep. you, you alluded to that, but I think from a STEM point of view, let's, let's, pay, let's, pay, let's take our hat off to the STEM programs in the United States. This is a great example of surface to volume ratio. Yep. And uh, do you want to explain that or you want me to? Or no, me Go ahead. I, you can do it if you want. But I, I, I was just thinking, before you go there, just thinking about the, the limitations on animals on land and the giraffe, you know, thinking of the giraffe that has a long neck because it can go and get food up high, but also the, 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 the limits to the amount of blood that can be pumped up along that long neck. And it was also a problem for certain dinosaurs. But anyway, now I'll let you talk about the... Right, there, the there, are, there are limits to growth. Uh, there's a book on it called Limits to Growth. There's only so tall that a tree can get, and otherwise it yeah, just same thing. We don't have the, the 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 biological mechanics and structure to get let it get any larger. And those trees are the ones that we know of. The California redwoods, I believe, are some of the tallest, and et cetera. And then there are limits to growth uh, in the ocean. And the blue whale is an example of the limit to growth in the ocean. I the the math, the, the energy requirements to get bigger, um, and the, uh, the, the, the biophysical challenge of getting any bigger is, is too much. And this seems to be the maximum size that an animal can get. And as you pointed out, it, uh, it's that size for musculature, which I hadn't actually thought that much about until you just mentioned it, Richard, but that's a really good point. They do have incredible musculature. They can throw that whole body out of the water uh, by swimming really fast and towards the surface and then the whole animal comes out. And if you think about throwing 80 tons uh, of mass out of the water in a swimming uh, action, essentially, you've got really strong, oh, there you go, there's a breach, okay, it's called. Well, that's a finback whale in the Mediterranean, so a close cousin to the blue whale, but look at that, it's an adult that's almost completely out of the water. Now, how can you imagine? Let's just think about most of our listeners and viewers swim, probably, or have swum. It's, it's impossible to throw yourself out of the water like that. We just yeah. can't do it. We can't get anywhere. The only way to do it is to push off the bottom of the pool. I've done it. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, and then back to the surface to volume ratio, I do want to pay attention to that. I might even put a graphic in here because it's important. And that is that the surface to volume ratio is just simply the um, surface area of the animal, and you could measure that in, uh, you know, square uh, uh, centimeters. And then the 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 volume is uh, cubic square centimeters. And in this case, you've got a fairly small number on the top of the ratio, and a really big number on the bottom. And what that does is it limits the area that is exposed to uh, the cold water in the ocean where it can um, cool the animal down and maximizes the, the, the protection of the body's organs in this, uh, the central mass area. So the, I always found that when I discovered that early in my career that they have a big problem with overheating. It just stunned me when you look at them swimming in ice pools and stuff. But it's, it's all about surface to volume ratios. And that's why with people, uh, small people that are kind of skinny have very low surface to volume ratios and they get cold really fast because they, 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 they have. If I may just interject, it also depends on blood circulation. And blood is a, is a, is a, is a component of this, absolutely. Um, and metabolism is a component of this, but they, uh, the surface to volume ratio keeps them cold. And then they also uh, 
are a incredible storage mechanism for uh, for food. Can you talk about that a little bit? How that works? Well, they <clears throat> they store a lot of the what they take in. They're looking for fatty foods. It's that kind of interesting when you look at certain species of whales. They'll go after a mackerel or herring, which have quite a lot of high lipid content and euphosids. Uh, another problem with uh, the size is that it limits you in the quickness of execution of going after prey. So that's where the odontocetes, the toothed whales, can go after individual prey, individual fish or squid and, um, and you know, do that time and time again. Whereas these larger whales have to find uh, organisms at school in very large, dense schools to be able to maximize their feeding technique with intake of uh, energy for their energy requirements. And the blue whales gone even further. I mean, as they, they go further up the, f or further up the food chain closer to the beginning by eating um, these small shrimp-like uh, organisms called euphosids or commonly called krill. And there are other species that filter out actually copepods. But so it, it shows you all the different dynamics that these animals have to go through, the sort of the different tricks that they have to go through to be able to survive in, in, the, in the oceans. Sorry, what was the question you, you had asked me? I told you about the, about the fat layers, but you reminded me of uh, one of our favorite movies and a line out of it. All they do is swim, eat, and make baby. Yeah. Well, that's not all they do. I, I take exception to that with whales. Maybe, maybe sharks are that way. But um, uh, I think that there's a lot more to um, marine mammals than people. I think, I think humans, we're very, I think we're quite limited because we're so scared of being anthropomorphic that we are... We, we try to look at everything in black and white. And of course, it's good to be able to test things scientifically. I think that's vital to the scientific method. But I think that sometimes because of our rigidity in looking at things, we miss things that are vital to the existence or to the way, to the behavior of, of these animals. And I think there's a lot more uh, to the socializing in these animals than one thinks. I mean, it if you looked at a blue whale, you'd think, well, okay, the mother's, or some of these baby whales, mother's on her own with her calf, the, the male that, that helped out in this equation is long gone someplace. But uh, perhaps in the uh, leading up to that, there was a lot more going on than, than we can perceive. But anyway, uh, yeah. as far as, as food storage, yeah, they, they build up these reserves in their blubber uh, or fat, and it's, perhaps not quite, I don't think we should think of it in terms of human blubber necessarily, but I, I, it's, it's a different quality. So when they get into situations where they can't find food um, uh, readily enough, they can draw on these reserves of energy that are found in the blubber. Now, if they, of course they go too far with that, then they start to have problems with um, you know, maintaining their body temperature and things of that sort. So everything's got to you have everything in, in nature um, has a balance to, you know, how far you can go one way before you start having detrimental effects another way. How thick is the rubber like at the end of a feeding season and how thick of it is, is at the end of a, you know, because uh, first of all, the, the, talk about their migratory patterns. What, what's, what's, a, what's the year? Well, with blue whales, if you were speaking specific about those, we still don't really know uh, uh, you know, we know something about the migratory patterns. For instance, if I look at uh, your area there off the West Coast, we know that they go down to an area called the Costa Rica Dome, at least some animals do. That's an area of upwelling way off the coast, well, it varies depending on the season, but off the coast of Costa Rica, where, there's, where there are productive waters because it cold, deep cold waters mixed with uh, warm surface waters. And I've been out there and you do see blue whales as well as sometimes other species. And, and there have been what we call matches. In other words, you can recognize individuals by their natural pigmentation. And there have been many matches to the California coast and up to perhaps Alaska. I can't quite remember at this time. And, and actually one time when I was down there a number of years ago, I, the first whale I spotted off the Costa Rican Dome to, turned out to be an animal that had also been seen in the Galapagos. So it, and there were people that had written papers 
about this long before that, that showed that that area is used by both southern and northern hemisphere blue whales, but of course at different times of year. So there are areas around the world where these animals know that it's a good place to go where they'll find food, but also that they can uh, give birth in those areas because of the, the heat budget and so on. Um, hey, Richard. And, and, yeah. Uh, sorry, I wanted to, to shift gears, if you don't mind, uh, just because you were, you were talking about, you know, anthropomorphizing and, and it, <laughs> for me, triggered, you know, as someone that uh, is interested in whales but knows very little, one way that I've been brought into their world in the past as you know, just a, a normal guy was through a sound. And I know that you're a musician, I'm a musician as well. And wherever I travel in the world, I connect to other cultures through music as well. And so I'm wondering if you can talk uh, for a minute about whales and sound and even music, as I've also heard that uh, some whales have been known to sort of uh, on, sing together. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't catch Alaska. Somebody's trying to reach me on Skype. <laughs> Sorry, right. no problem. Now, I had heard that, uh, that whales make music, and I wonder if you can speak to that. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I'll, I'll give the disclaimer that I'm not an acoustician, but um, I, yeah, they, we, we call it, uh, the, the term song is used often for, um, well, I think it's particularly in regards to humpback whales because we know that where they go to the, their breeding grounds, whether it be Hawaii in, in, the, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere in the Pacific or even the coast of Mexico, or here it's in the Caribbean down north of the Dominican Republic, or, uh, you can go there and hear the males uh, creating sounds, which we call songs. It was actually came from a guy called Roger Payne and his wife, Katie Payne, who developed this. And they're actually, they were both musicians. They are both musicians. And um, um, so that it was kind of interesting that, that that would be that kind of link up. They actually took the sounds of these animals and put them into phrases. And, um, and they saw, and that's how they learned that the song would change over time, but quite slowly, some phrases were maintained. Now, as far as, um, I mean, I, 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 my limitations on this is that, it, you know, if I put a hydrophone over the side, I can, we, we can hear it at the end of the fall. Um, we can hear the humpback start to sing up here in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And as the days go by, you, you know, the first few days you hear little, little bits of song. And then by two weeks later, it's a full song and just, perhaps prior to some of these animals migrating south. And as they move south, the song, uh, from what I understand, changes. So the, each year has a different overall song, but it'll even change the thing. And I, I think the problem is that humans are still inadequate in our technologies and in our way of analyzing these sounds. I think we're going to find out that much more, um, there's much more to them than we had first thought but that's the nature of the game. So what are they trying to say? Um, a guy called Jim Darling um, in working Hawaii has found that in his work that, um, that it, it seems to be an attractant for males joining up and then they join up groups that chase after females hoping to mate with them. Uh, the females don't seem to, to create these kinds of songs. They do produce sounds because if you've, you've probably seen, and again, I'm speaking of humpbacks here, but if you, um, you've probably seen the images from Alaska of groups of humpbacks coming up with their jaws open feeding on herring. Well, they've been able to record, biologists be able to record uh, sounds produced at that moment, and it's almost like a pure tone signal by perhaps one or more individuals. And it's, I, I, I think it's kind of like, okay, hike on three and you're gonna be in this position, you're gonna be in that position, you're gonna come up and so, so that they don't run into each other and yet they're very, very close quarters. Um, now for blue whales and finbacks, for instance, um, we had a, a young, well, not so young anymore, but uh, Catherine Birchock worked with me. She's now at uh, Fisheries in, um, Washington State, NOAA, 
and she uh, did her PhD on blue whale acoustics. And the problem is you can't hear them most of the time. Uh, it's below our hearing, they're down to 20 Hertz. And um, so you have to have specialized gear that uh, accelerates the sound that they produce to be able to hear it. And a guy called Chris Clark did a lot of that um, when he was still very active uh, working on blue whales. And he and I used to have long conversations about these things. But uh, so you can hear it. And it, what's interesting, I was going to talk later on if, if that was of interest about these, when you see a pair of blue whales, you can almost bet that the lead animal in the pair is a female and the one behind it's a male. That doesn't mean that they mate for life or anything. It just, to me, it's sort of like a dating arrangement. You know, the male says, well, maybe this female will be receptive to me. And so he follows along and he gets a benefit because he's drafting behind her, sort of like birds, you know, geese in formation. And, and he also may be benefiting from her knowledge of where to feed. And he's just sort of hanging back going, okay, baby, I'm, I'm here, you know, maybe this will work out. But then there's a third animal that might be around. And because we know the sexes of these animals, you'll have, uh, you can watch the third animal. Let's say everybody's diving for 10, 12 minutes, normal pattern, blah, blah, blah. And if you see one of these other males that's hanging around come up halfway through its dive and take a big gulp of air and go back down, then you can almost bet something's going to happen. And within a few minutes after that, maybe as many as six minutes, all three animals come up really energetically porpoising at the surface. I mean, if you can imagine blue whales porpoising at the surface, I can show you a couple of pictures later on. So, and what's interesting about this is uh, it's been found by Catherine and others that at the point at which the, the third animal is approaching, and it's invariably another male, okay, keep that in mind, that animal goes from 20 hertz down to 8 hertz. So what in nature makes it sound like a male is big? A deep tone. Deep voice. Okay. So this guy goes from 20 hertz, which you'd think is already kind of, you know, and he goes even deeper. And, um, and, he's, and he's going, I'm coming. You know, and uh, so the, the guy that's with the, the female, he's going, oh boy, here comes, you know, whoever it is. Okay. And uh, so at that point, the female will, when she feels the pressure from these two animals, I think the female is the one that starts the, what they call coursing, the, the race. And it'll last anywhere from six minutes to a half hour. And so the male that, it, that is in attendance, the, the primary escort, if you want to call it that, which is similar to humpbacks and their breeding grounds, you'll, he'll have to keep up with the female and also ward off the attacks by the intruding male. Just think about it. So there's a lot of energy expended. And in, in those instances, there are tails hitting heads or body, body bangs and things like that. Of course, it's all on the scale of a blue whale. So it's impressive to us little things but you know and after about 10 minutes usually the primary escort is the one that stays there and the intruder goes off sort of a little bit bruised and goes about his business but this is a kind of thing that happens we call these rumbas i don't know why it just sort of came out of What's the significance of the gulp of air the gulp of air yeah you said that Oh, he's getting a little bit of extra oxygen to, because he knows he's going to get into a fight. Oh, okay, okay. So he, he, we call it a one pop up. He comes up, gets a, an extra gulp of air because if otherwise he'd have to come up at the end of his normal sequence. And In relation to his nostril, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not his mouth and the blowhole. Takes a breath of air, so he takes another deep breath. <clears throat> and when you see that, you know that he's built up, he's gotten a little more oxygen and he's ready for a fight. Wow. So, uh, and uh, anyway, I can- volume of their lungs, Richard, offhand? Sorry? Or the volume of their lungs? Yeah. Uh, you know, you asked me these questions that I used to know, but I've forgotten long ago. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I have no idea at this point what the, I'm gonna give a figure that's completely wrong. You gotta think big. Big, big. Yeah, no, I mean, they're big bags, you know, these lungs are huge bags. I mean, like a school bus? No. Or like a Volkswagen no, 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 no. bug? Sorry? A school bus or a Volkswagen bug? Well, the heart is the size of a Volkswagen bug. Uh, the lungs, 
<clears throat> I don't know, I suppose it could stretch out even bigger than that. I mean, what we do know is that when they exchange the air in their lungs, they do it at a very high uh, efficiency rate. You know, we only, we only use about, exchange about 10% of our air. I think they do, you know, more like 75, 80% of the air in their lungs. So, um, you know, it's quite a bit different, but of course we don't live the way they do. Uh, but to come back to your sound um, question, uh, one of the things that's really interesting when we've been in, uh, what Catherine discovered is when there were these trios, there was a unique sound produced at the time that these uh, interactions were taking place. And it started almost at the point at which we saw the activity on the surface and it ended just at the point where it stopped. So there's a very unique um, sound, a bunch of sounds produced during those uh, moments. And it seems to me, I'm talking to Chris Clark and others who've seen things of that nature, that it's probably mostly the males that are producing it. And I don't want to venture as to what they're saying to each other, but, um, you know. So, but the other thing is that's really fascinating is I remember several times over the years, I've been in situations like that, and I'm sitting in the boat, motor off, and all of a sudden I'm feeling something. I'm feeling like a vibration or something, and I'm going, okay, am I imagining this, or, or is there something really in the air? So on occasion, you kind of, kind of, I don't know if you, I would say I could hear it, but you can feel something going on. And I remember looking at the other people in the boat and I, you know, it's almost like you don't want to dare say anything, but everybody sort of looks at each other and you know, every, everybody's noticing it. And then after we talked about it, yeah, and everybody in the boat, well, there were four of us had noticed that there was some vibration or some, something going on in the air when the animals with the surface around us without actually hearing a sound the way you do with humpbacks. Hmm. Does that make any sense to you? Okay. Well, I so, think it does, and it gets to what I was trying to get at in general is size, size. Like hmm. the, the heart that is the size of a Volkswagen. I mean, just think about that for a second. I mean, that's enormous. <laughs> you could, we could probably swim through the aorta, right? I mean, it's like. Well, I don't know about swim through, but we a certain we could probably crawl through it. Yeah. We might meet up with some nasty-looking six-foot heartworms, but. Um, yeah. Wow. Here, let me put in a picture of one of these. Hey, oh, wait a minute. I haven't put the uh, file sharing on. Hold on. I got too many, too many steps in all this. And, you know, one of the reasons we're interested in this, of course, Richard, is that um, Dan and I and others are working on the largest environmental impact assessment ever conducted in the history of the world. I think it's in that category, not the, it's certainly one of the uh, offshore because we're working to supply the world with metals for the renewable energy future from polymetallic nodules. So we're very interested in all the animals that live in the ocean. And uh, I don't think that the uh, clarion clipper and fracture zone where we're working is a blue whale spot, but I'd be interested if you hmm. had any information about that, but go ahead with what you're doing here. Well, I mean, let me just explain this picture. You guys all see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So the, the, the animal that's in front is blocking the guy that seems to be on its back. Okay. And these are two known males to me. I, I know them because I biopsied them. So I know the genetics, you know, that this, it's not just something that I see in the animals that makes me think it's a male, I know. And the female is already out of the picture to the left. She's racing along, waiting for these two guys, show me who's the toughest, you know, who's the most fit, you know, come on boys, have at it. And, um, you know, if you look at the lower jaw of this uh, second animal, I don't know if it's caused by these combats or if it's caused by feeding down the bottom, you can see scar tissue there. But, um, uh, anyway, just after this last um, bit during this Roomba, that the back animal broke off and went on his own, you know, perhaps a bit bruised and everything. But, uh, yeah, you know, you think about it, these are like 80, 85 ton animals racing along at the surface and then beating the tar out of each other. <laughs> it's, um, let me give you another look from a drawing so you can perhaps... 85 ton. Now that's like 40 Volkswagens. Okay, if you say so. 
Uh, but <laughs> I, it's more like a big school bus, you know, in size or two. No, what am I saying? Two, two, three school buses. Wait, it's, it's about 40 Volkswagens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But look, you can see here, that's the, so the female is the one down at the bottom of this drawing. And then you have the primary escort he's being run into by the intruding animal, right? Nice. Okay. And let me, this is actually a kind of a nice picture by Flip Nicklin. Um, let's see if I can get this up. Okay, so what you have here is a pair and there's the intruder coming up and you notice he's blowing bubbles. Now those bubbles, to come back to the sound thing, they make noise underwater. They're a visual cue and they're an acoustic cue. So when they, when they make these bubbles, it almost sounds, I call it rumble breath as opposed to trumpeting and humpbacks because it sounds like a truck on air brakes coming down a hill. And if you saw a female on her own uh, and she started doing that, you might think it's vis-a-vis -vis the boat. You know, you kind of hear a like that. And, and you can almost bet that there's another animal around her. And sure enough, a minute or so later, up pops this other animal that's caused her to react like this. But in this case, it's the more classic pair. And you have this animal that's trying to intrude between them. And so they're soon probably going to have at it. Wow. So we've established something about the size, which I wanted to, which is good. Um, Dan, thank you for taking us in the direction of sound. I like that. That's, that's important. Richard, you've described some social behavior, which, which I think uh, is important. And also, we should point out that um, you know, our understanding of social behavior is very much in its infancy um, because it's so hard to study these animals where they live. They just live on shore. And, they're so big and it's hard to really, really get near them. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, the, uh, the importance of blue whales or the threats to blue whales or the status of blue whales? You know, give us an idea of where they're, how they're doing now that, you know, humanity has fully colonized the planet very rapidly. And well, now let's the impacts of that. Okay, let me let me go back to um, yeah, it's an, it's a valid story, but let me go back to um, where was I going to go here? Um, okay, so you you may know that uh, at one point late yeah. late. Um, 19th century into the 20th century when steam engines came about and a guy called Sven, Sven Fon had invented the explosive head harpoon, um, whaling took on a whole new connotation. It wasn't just like Nantucket whalers rowing after sperm whales and throwing a bunch of spears into them or harpoons and then getting towed for miles on a Nantucket sleigh ride. Um, sometimes surviving it, sometimes not. Um, it completely changed. They developed faster catcher boats. And so uh, people had discovered that in the Southern Hemisphere, it was just actually a cornucopia of whales. And so, uh, and you can see here the Southern tip of South America, you can see the Falklands, the island that's just pretty much in the middle of the top frame is South Georgia and down to the Antarctic Peninsula. So on South Georgia alone, there were six manned whaling stations year round. And there were a few other spots from which they whaled. And, uh, and as well as the Antarctic Peninsula. And then factory ships that tied up to the ice, uh, ice edge. And they ended up killing somewhere in the vicinity of 325,000 or more blue whales in the Southern Hemisphere. Much, there, were also, there was also whaling in the Northern Hemisphere, but it didn't really uh, even reach 20,000 animals. It was more like around 13, 15,000 whales killed. Um, so we, if you think about it, we reduced blue whales to a global population that was most likely below 2% left and maybe less than that. 
And what's remarkable is they seem to be crawling back. Um, there, there are more and more, well, it's also the fact that there are more biologists working in different parts of the world. There are people down there off the, uh, off of the uh, coast of Chile working on blue whales. There are people, um, there, there are sightings in the Mal off the Maldives. There are people working in the Sri Lanka. There are people working off Madagascar. Anyway, there are a lot, so the, because there are more eyes looking, you have, um, you know, more um, information. And um, so there seem to be populations that have done quite well. Uh, the California or the, the, the Mexico or Costa Rica to Alaska population, the last time I looked was estimated to be around 3,000 some odd, it may be a bit more by now uh, in population. That was based on photo ID work and also on lion transects. Um, uh, in, the, in the Northwest Atlantic, our catalog is at 600, nearly 600 animals, but that's over 42 years. So there's most likely some natural cause of death mixed in with, you know, a cause of death due to nets or collisions that we don't know about because these animals have disappeared. Uh, and then if I look at the work I've done been able to do in, co in collaboration with many, many other people off the coast of, well, been in the Azores, but that depended on people in the Iceland and Spitsbergen and sending in photographs, but much less effort. For instance, in the St. Lawrence, we work four or five months a year. Um, so nearly a hundred days a year on the water. Whereas in the Azores- When you put a slide up, could you like to like start your program so we get a full screen? You know. Uh, I just hit the play button when you're on a picture so we get the full. Okay, I, I just turned it down because I wanted to go to this one. But anyway, so this is Gritvik in, in, on South Georgia. It's actually now being dismantled. Uh, and, you know, almost, it's actually almost completely gone. But this was the main whaling station uh, for that area. And this is also the place where um, they took in the same day, it seems, the two largest blue whales ever found, about 110 feet. Wow. But you know, just the problem is we say all the time that blue whales will make it to 100 feet in length or more, but that would be like saying that all humans are seven foot five or something or seven foot two. And so there are many other, you know, most blue whales are in the, let's say 80 to 90 foot range, which is still pretty big. Um, so yeah, what was I saying? So I was talking about the Azores. So the, the, the little bit of work, much less effort involved in the Azores, two to three weeks a year, plus people contributing perhaps during the full month of May and into June, we, we're now over 800 blue whales known. And um, that, that just blew me away. I never thought that by going to the Azores some 25 years ago, I would find more than a handful of blue whales, like tens of. And now just in the Azores alone, we've seen over 600 blue whales go by there in the spring, migrating by on their way some, somewhere else. And we do know that <clears throat> there's a link between the Northwest coast of Africa, presumably a breeding ground, let's say Mauritania to Senegal, uh, and that uh, one of those animals has been seen twice in the Azores and once off of Iceland. And then there are many, several matches between the Azores and Spitsbergen, Ireland, Iceland. Okay, so we have a fairly good idea. So if they were able to kill 325,000 blue whales in that era of whaling and around the turn of the century and on, in the Southern hemisphere alone, um, my, and I know there's some statistics and some better analyses around, but my, my sort of expert opinion just off the top here would tell me that there was probably uh, a population down there, you know, somewhere inside of a million, right, that they were hunting from, I would guess. Um, no, no, I don't think there were quite, you mean just of blue whales? Yeah. I don't think there were quite that many. I think they redu I think the population might not have been more than around 400,000 or so. They got, their, their, their efficiency was really high. I, I think that when humans start harvesting something, that's one of the things we're very good at. <laughs> yeah. 
unfortunately. And um, uh, I think that uh, I think they came close to wiping them out. So if you had 400 down there, what, what, what's your guesstimate of how many there were elsewhere in the world before we started killing them? Well, I think that probably in the Northern Hemisphere, there, must, there probably were 20 to 30,000, perhaps. Maybe a little less, maybe a little higher. You know, a lot of these numbers, you could almost have anybody throwing a dart at a figure between, you know, 10 and 20,000 for the Northern Hemisphere. Of, I mean, the North Atlantic, I should say, and be as close to anybody at the original number. In the North Pacific, it might have been about the same or more. I mean, we now have a much better uh, we have a better, I don't know about much better, but a better understanding about the, the numbers of blue whales that might have been there at one time. But the thing, there were never as many, it seems, because the whalers, all, all manner of whalers, were drawn to the Southern Hemisphere. I mean, even Onassis was operating whaling operations down in South Georgia at, at the end of the per time period there, which ended in the, in the early 60s. The, the pre-whaling population was probably something like 500,000 to 700,000 or 600,000 or something like that, you think? It could have been, yeah, it could so, have been. Today, what, what's your guess at what the population is? Well, that's what I say. I think uh, the, the world, the global population could certainly be uh, at a minimum of around 15,000 and, and then your guess is as good as mine as to how many of them might really be we don't we don't know yet okay so significant impact there they have not recovered um but they appear to be creeping up in numbers which is a good, good yeah, i would say that the the northeast atlantic story is very encouraging because we see a lot of calves for us here in the in the st lawrence we see calves only sporadically a couple of years ago we had what amounted to a baby boom of seven or eight calves but last year no calves sighted this year so far no calves sighted so in total, over 42 years of work there, we've had around 30 some odd calves. That's very, very few when you consider that humpbacks in a season just in the Gulf of St. Lawrence might have anywhere from 10 to 20 calves yeah. come in with their mothers. So, um, yeah, it's still problematic. This seems to be a reproductive, something weird going on reproductively. And, and also, although a couple of years ago, the, the females that had calves were well known to us. So there's no reason to, you know, it's hard to understand why we do not see more calves from those females. Now, perhaps that was an, uh, a year of anomaly and that in some ways the, the uh, calves were weaned before those females got into the St. Lawrence. They could have, but if you talk to people working outside the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all along Nova Scotia, where you were on Brown's Bank, where they do occasionally see blue whales and off New England. They just had a blue whale a couple of weeks ago along Cape Cod uh, and, and on down to Virginia and so on. Nobody reports calves. So uh, you would think that with all the aerial surveys going on and, and other kinds of surveys that if, if blue whales had a number of calves that people would notice them. Now the other, the other problem with that is that perhaps the blue whales are way off the shelf edge most of the time. So they're out in even deeper water. And we know from satellite tags that these blue whales actually do go way, way offshore along, uh, especially in this part of the world, a, a series of uh, seamounts called the New England seamounts, which actually even humans know very little about. The Alvin from Woods Hole has only been on the closest ones to the shelf so far. And um, but we've seen that sperm whales use that area, humpbacks on their migration north go stop off there, blue whales certainly, we don't know about finbacks because we haven't really had tags on them there. Uh, we know that puffins, the bird, also are found there in large numbers in winter off these New England seamounts. And these seamounts, they reach out more than a thousand kilometers into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, another thing I'll throw into the pot is that three of the blue whales that we've know from the St. Lawrence have also been seen in the Azores. Okay, that's a very small number. It's, there's probably not that much movement between those two areas, but it does show you um, that these large whales will use whole ocean basins. They're not just where we like them to be close to shore or on continental shelves. They're, they're way out there. They can apparently make use of seamounts that are anywhere around the world and they can be out in the middle of an ocean. So 
um, I think one has to look at it in that way as well, is that we're, we're very lucky that the places we've chosen to work on whales is because the whales happen to nicely come in close to where we are. And that often these animals can be out in the middle of nowhere, for humans anyway, for whales it's probably not nowhere, but for us it is. <laughs> and um, so you have to change your whole perspective about that. And I, I'm sure, Greg, that's easy for you because you've been in a lot of places and you've seen a lot of species and a lot of um, you know, varied uh, spots around the world. But I think that these whales, uh, and when you, when you look at how some ant humpbacks will switch breeding grounds, like I was talking to a guy in Colombia last week and uh, some of the whales that they see off of the co Pacific coast of Colombia have, have also been to um, Tonga, not in the same year, but they're, so they'll, they'll vary like that. And actually some of the whales that go to Hawaii sometimes also go to the Ogasawara Islands off Japan. So it's, it's a minor proportion of the population that does that, but th there's always that possibility. Yeah, and, and the whales today are, kind of want to bring us back to the current status and the, the way the world's working today and how we've, this whole idea that we've colonized the planet, us humans, and we're trying to find a new, a new steady state or a new, a new uh, I mean, I think we've used the term urbanized the ocean, haven't we? That's a term that I've heard used. The, uh, we have a colleague who wrote a book called The Urban Whale. Well, certainly this humpback that's here in Montreal is an urban whale. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with that humpback? You said there's a humpback. He says, I'm going to go out and have a look later. He's just right here. He's been here for a couple of weeks now, and he's probably feeding, maybe feeding on alewife, which are kind of herring. And um, but he's this animal's a young animal. It's very tenaciously staying here. I never would have dreamt of seeing a humpback this far up the St. Lawrence. But, but you know, to come back to your subject about how we've colonized the planet, yeah. this slide I like it a lot because it's a of uh, one of the whaling stations, Strom Ness, in, on in South Georgia. And when humans left, they left all this, well, it looks like junk, but actually it's quite you know, valuable material, props and all kinds of metals that are gonna have to be removed from there at great expense. But what's amusing about this image is that the minute the humans left, the other animals came back and recolonized everything. I mean, the penguins are walking around in these propellers, and if you go into some of the sheds that were left, they're still standing. I call them sort of like opium dens for elephant seals. You go in there and you hear all of a sudden this very guttural sound, and there's a bunch of elephant seals in the back of the shed. So they, they very quickly took back what we humans had implanted there to kill another bunch of species. But uh, if you leave, it just shows you if you leave animals alone for a while, um, you can um, they'll, they'll come back. Problem. Hold on a second, guys. I'm getting a cramp in my leg. <laughs> Greg, I've got about uh, six minutes before my family is going to pull me out of here. Okay, well, let's say I'm, I'm back. I think I, I can hang on here. Okay. <laughs> you'd like to say Dan why don't you why don't you go now just or, no it's been a great a great talk and um obviously Richard your your encyclopedic knowledge I think we could sit here all day but um I wouldn't go that far but anyway <laughs> yeah now you know getting to the, the the point that Greg started to make about sort of historic population numbers and, and where we are today I wonder, um, you know, one of the one of the big themes um, that's always on everything uh, on our minds, everything we do, is uh, is climate change and how that impacts whales. <laughs> and so we were talking about, um, you know, body size and mass and how that affects temperature regulation and, and whatnot. But I wonder, um, you know, with with climate change, what is the biggest effect or impact on on whales on blue whales well i think it would be an, an effect on their food um, and uh, to alter the patterns of euphosid production and and distribution in a place like the saint lawrence so far we haven't really noticed anything of that nature and actually climate change for a time may enhance some of that um 
some of the productivity in certain areas before it starts going the other way because the last few la last year we had a record year for the number of blue whales that were uh, photo ID'd in the St. Lawrence. Um, and I, so it, it's hard to measure. You, you, you need to have a full battery of oceanographic um, equipment and you know we're just out there looking at the whales and it seems as though it's altered the arrival times of humpbacks and finbacks. Uh, they seem to arrive earlier in the season. Um, but um, as far as blue whales, they seem to be pretty much on a similar pattern. But what we have noticed is that the animals move around even more than they used to. They, they, may, be, they may be forced to search for the right density of prey uh, further afield than they're used to. So all those factors will cause them to use more energy. And if they don't find what they need, then that's a deficit for those animals. But we're not certain about that. Yeah, yeah I would think their challenges are finding each other um, to yeah. make, given the population size, and then also uh, making, making sure they have enough to eat given that we're essentially competing with them for food because we're taking so much out of the ocean for our own uses that um, some fishery management bodies are beginning to allocate parts of the catch for whales. <laughs> They're saying, here's the population of herring and we're gonna take this much out for commercial uh, fishing and we're gonna leave this much in for whales and then we're going to leave this much in for an ongoing population it's quite interesting that we're starting but, but i think it's a combination of things dan is that you have collision from ships increased number of shipping going on especially in a place like the saint lawrence where you have tremendous amount of shipping coming into montreal and other parts other harbors plus uh with overfishing you have um you've altered the the uh, food chain food chain disruption. Uh, in other words, here would be the destruction of codfish, which are a major predator. Uh, you could also add haddock to that and sebastes. And because of that, you have uh, less control over the smaller fish that the cod might eat, the adult cod, like herring and sand lance and capelin. And so those guys will eat more euphosids. So you have direct competition of fish with blue whales and other species. Uh, so all those factors, plus you add in climate change effects, uh, you have a lot of different things that can cause um, problems for, for these animals. Uh, but as far as finding each other, they, this group seems to find each other. I mean, there's certainly a number of males and females. The, the problem is I'm wondering if there's something else going on, perhaps pollutants or something that is causing some sort of I wouldn't say they're sterile because we've seen calves produce once in a while, but they, it may be causing some negative effects in reproduction. That seems to be what, what is occurring. I see. Before Dan goes, I want to ask you a question. Um, can you tell us one of the most interesting things or memorable things or uh, that you've seen? Just, just give us a little. Yeah, I can. I, I, I have one that really stands out to me. I remember one of the last days, when I was working in the Sea of Cortez off Loreto in Baja, California, there were four of us that were out. It was a Mexican biologist, a local a guy that we knew, and we were using his boat, and myself and a guy called Christian Ramp, and who's worked with me for a while. And we went out um, to behind this island called Carmen and looking for blue whales, and we found uh, two adults uh, that were, you know, a little bit away from us and all of a sudden a calf popped up or what looked like a calf, small animal. And we figured that the calf after a while belonged to one of the two animals that was just a, maybe a mile away and that the calf was old enough to go off and play with its own toys. And so we were one of the toys. And um, <clears throat> so then I had my Nikonos at that time because we still didn't have, it was still not digital cameras or at least not ones that we could afford in those days and I remember I jumped in with uh, Fernando and and this calf just kept swimming he swam with us for three and a half hours and just came right underneath us looked at us was eyeballing us it was just one of the most and the calf was already 30 feet long 10 meters 
So it was just one of the most fantastic experiences uh, I can imagine. And you just kind of wish that those things would happen more often. And I remember at one point I was, <clears throat> this, I was facing the sun and the calf came around like right next to me. I mean, it could have stuck out its flipper and just patted me on the back or whatever. And it slowed, you know, because we're very slow swimmers, even those of us who think we're good swimmers. <laughs> we're pathetic compared to these other these mammals. And the animal slowed down to my excruciatingly slow pace. And um, it was just looking at me straight in the eye through the mask, you know, just going, what is this thing? You know, I haven't seen this before. What are these weird looking things? And I had my Nikonos and I'm taking pictures. And I remember at one point I just forgot about taking pictures and I just raised my arm up and I was like, this is what a moment, you know, what a moment. And uh, I remember we, Christian had been a little bit reticent of getting in because he wasn't as used to being in the water as the rest of us. And I said, you've got to go in. So he went in and he was looking around at the surface for where the blue whale was. And I said, look down, look down, because I could see the blue, this blue streak coming in behind him. And he looked down and the blue whale must have been right under his legs, you know, going by having a look. And I fully expected the mother to come over at one point and have this huge animal show up. But she never did. She obviously there was commu you know, if there was communication between the two, it was like, yeah, mom, I'm fine over here. I got these weird creatures I'm swimming around with. I, they don't seem to be harmful. And uh, and um, but that was one of the best moments. And there there were a few others like that, but never that long. It was it was a length of time we were able to spend with this animal in in its, in its own medium. Uh, you know, we were definitely foreigners there, and. Um, uh, you know, it was just fantastic. Yeah. Well, Richard, That's amazing. I'll tell you something. I Clearly, we've got a body of knowledge and work that's going to take up more than one episode. But um, what I'd like to do is uh, ask you if you'd be willing to uh, come back another time as well. And we'll do kind of a part two. Um, I think this is kind of a get to know you. And you've given us some sort of a good overview. And you've given me some ideas I'd like to drill down on, but uh, we've sort of come to the end of our time here. And, uh, and yeah, don't drill too far, though. No, no. And I, and I, <laughs> <laughs> one of the missions of our company is to, uh, you know, find ways for the ocean and humanity to support each other in the modern world and make it work. You know, and I know you devoted yourself to that. And Dan and I are, are working that uh, in our company, Deep Green, which is Deep Green Metals. Uh, and we're uh, the part sponsor of this podcast. We thank them. We thank our other sponsors, the Bucks Bomb Foundation, uh, Wendy Benchley, um, a few other people you probably know, um, Ed, Edgar Schein. I'd like to thank, give them a shout out during these times. But that's uh, this week's episode. And I want to thank you. And Dan, I want to thank you for, for being here with me. And uh, Richard, I admire and I appreciate all the work you've done over the years. You really are the guy. And um, it takes well, a lot. As I say in Spanish, igualimento, buddy. <laughs> it means the same to you. <laughs> igualmente. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Thanks and, Richard. Yeah, nice to have met you. And we'll see you next week, everybody. I, I think, Dan, you're much more of a musician than I'll ever dream of being. But anyway. <laughs> hey, well, maybe, uh, maybe next time we can have a live jam. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> goodbye for now. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, that's the episode. That was great, Richard. It's fantastic. I was thinking, you, you think you got some video too, right? Yeah, it's not mine. It's from a, I don't know how that works because I really shouldn't have it be disseminated, but they've let me, you know, they gave me all the rough footage. Okay. But I've got, a, I've got one shot, which is kind of nice. It's a blue whale swimming along on its own. And then all of a sudden, you see it change behavior. It rolls over, and there's a shot of air coming up from underneath it. And another animal comes up right there. So it, it shows you how these guys interact. If this show was unfolding. I'm thinking if you have any video at all that ask them for permission to use for it's a it's a non-profit kind of a, yeah yeah no they, he's cool about that jeff turner but uh and some of that well some of your conversations going on because i think that would uh, really live it would be helpful yeah but they're they're rough cuts huh you, you know, well, you know we're, 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 our editor will cut it he just needs something to work from okay. yeah okay fine no problem
Yeah, and we'll be in touch. Well, I hope that I hope that was to your. It's great. It was great. This is the kind of stuff people like today. Is this genuine kind of back and forth, you know? And um, I'll probably tighten the beginning up a little bit. I'll cut out some of the uh, 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 wandering stuff and get to the color. And then um, you were you were fantastic. You've got a nice appealing personality. You're obviously got an encyclopedic knowledge of this and. Well, uh, I want to hear about blue whales. You know, I've got a list that I kind of been asking about. You're, you're one of the, you were right at the top of it. So, but I do want to do another episode probably a few months later. You know, we'll okay, come. no problem. I'll do that. Yeah. All right. I'll be here. Thank, thanks. So, thanks so much. Yeah. No, well, it was fun. Thank you. I, I enjoy these things too. I, I keep. It's, fun. it's usually it's always good. If everybody has fun, it's always a good. Yeah, program. yeah. I always have fun with this stuff. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. All right. Anyway, All see, right. see you around, man. Okay, bye.